Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for our third in a series of six uh, presentations on the psychology of chronic illness, making it normal, brought to you by Bateman Horn Center and myself, Timothy Wyman. I'm a licensed clinical social worker providing counseling services through telecounseling um, for Utah and Arizona residents. Uh, I come to this topic. My main aim of this topic was that there's quite a gap in uh, patients receiving information and just a normalization of what they're going through from both medical and psychological professionals. So I wanted to provide a brief overview of generally what the research says is really normal for people with chronic illness to go through. Uh, we've broken this up into six different parts. Uh, development and phases of chronic illness, anxiety, depression, identity, relationships, uh, meaning making, religion, and spirituality and existentialism. And today uh, our focus on this presentation is going to be depression. So first of all, let's review symptoms of depression. How do you know you're depressed officially? We all have moments of sadness, um, but I want to break down a few common symptoms. Uh, the first theme of these symptoms being cognitive or thinking symptoms. So what's going on in our heads when we're depressed? First off, we can have ruminations about past loss, losses and difficulties. Ruminations are repetitive, uh, almost intrusive memories that keep coming up where we, we're, we're thinking of a past really difficult time uh, that we may even be currently present, that might not be completely resolved and we're experiencing presently as well. Uh, we can have a disturbed sense of self-concept and a low self-esteem. A general fuzziness in our thinking that can include slowing down in responses or memory or recall issues. Now this can be kind of a crossover between some of the cognitive issues associated with ME, CFS, and fibromyalgia. So it sometimes can be hard which is which and where this is coming from. Nevertheless, it is a symptom of depression as well. Um, we can have preoccupation with um, so-called negative uh, thoughts or and aspects of, and challenging and aspects of living. Um, difficulty creating and accessing a sense of purpose and meaning. Difficulty for seeing a hopeful future and even at its worst we can develop suicidal ideation if we're not interrupting any of these processes. Uh, it can lead to suicidal thoughts. Emotional uh, or feeling and sensations that you can have related to depression can be difficulty accessing positive emotions or any emotions. So you can have kind of this flat affect or blunted where you're just, nothing really seems to affect you uh, positively or negatively. Uh, a sadness or generally feeling blue or at its worst, some despair. There can be lethargy and apathy, uh, feeling lost, um, but also it can lead to increased irritability or agitation and anhedonia, which is you know Greek for not no pleasure. Um, difficulty accessing a sense of pleasure or difficulty feeling pleasure in things you once found pleasurable. Uh, some behavior that you could see in yourself or someone else, which could indicate depression includes reducing the frequency and intensity of activities you once found pleasurable, increased use of substances or other self-soothing behaviors, um, examples can be binge eating, excessive sexual activity, out of control spending, escaping into social media or games or whatever. Um, frequently finding yourself checking out or disassociating during the day mentally. Um, increased time spent housebound or bedbound, not attributed to your physical limitations. Uh, engaging in reckless behavior without much care for the consequences. That can also be a warning sign of an escalating depression, which really needs attention um, as it can predict some suicide modality. Um, engaging in self-harm, not performing as well as you used to at work, uh, school or in your duties at home, and general difficulty keeping pace with previous levels of energy and activity. Once again, not attributed to your physical diagnoses. Relational symptoms, so the way our relationships can play out when one or more partners are depressed or not just partners, but in family and friendships. Um, we can become socially withdrawn or isolated, uh, increased arguments with people in our lives, feeling generally less invested in people we care about or have previously cared about, and feeling generally disconnected from others. Physical symptoms can include stomach disturbance, appetite disturbance, in which there can be a decrease or increase, a disturbance in your sexual functioning, 
a disturbance in your sleep, difficulty going to sleep, staying asleep, going back to sleep, or sleeping in excessive amounts, lethargy and fatigue, slowing down of motor activity like your speech or your general physical movements, um, or headaches. All of those can be indicative that there's some depression going on and could suggest that it could be good for you to be further assessed um, with like a medical provider or a behavioral health provider um, to determine if a diagnosis of depression is appropriate. So depression, if we look at this before we get into the, the details of this slide, depression is a common co-occurring disorder across many chronic illnesses. It would not be super abnormal for you to have depression. One way that this is explained is first, biologically, you're having a lot of changes going on in your body due to the illness. So there could be a biological component to it. Outside of that, because of the biological changes, people experience a significant amount of loss related to chronic illness. Um, for example, in a 2000 study of 30 people who were at working age and had chronic illness with an average disease duration of 18 years had shown that all individuals had experienced repeated physical, emotional, and social losses. Uh, most common were the loss of bodily function, relationships, autonomous life, and life imagined. So we have here loss of hope. You know, people, maybe you had hopes that things would go differently than they are going because of your illness. Uh, loss of control over your body and bodily function, loss of integrity and dignity. Um, it can be very humiliating to have to maybe get help you need for basic tasks or things of that nature. Loss of a healthy identity, seeing yourself as this kind of a person. Um, I know before I got sick, I was a runner and I loved it. Um, and I have not been able to do that again. Um, a loss of faith that life is just, a uh, loss of social relations, um, it's not uncommon um, for you to lose friends because you perhaps cannot relate to them anymore if they're not chronically ill or they can't relate to you. And more than that, sometimes the social isolation that's necessary because of that being housebound or bedbound, people can slowly stop maybe calling or inviting and things of that nature. Loss of freedom and autonomy. Uh, if you have functional disability, you can become dependent on different people for different things. And generally, loss of life imagined. You know, I, most people who acquire a chronic illness later in life and were born with it do have different plans um, for their lives. So as you can see, this is a significant amount of loss. So it's, hopefully it's not surprising when you look at this list to think, yeah, like it makes sense that it would lead to depression. And because researchers were, have documented all of this multiple times, um, they come up with this term in this last point. Consequently, the research indicates that many with chronic illness experience what is called chronic sorrow. And depression is a common co-occurring disorder with many diseases. So that's the bad news. What's the good news and how do we face this? Um, we see this here in this slide, depression coping strategies. So these are specific to, uh, to depression and chronic illness. Um, you're going to see a lot of crossover here from the treatment from anxiety, um, the anxiety presentation. Um, anxiety and depression are essentially known as sisters in the mental health community, they, meaning they often come together. And so a lot of the treatments that are effective for anxiety are effective for depression and vice versa. Um, one of the main treatments can be at the top increasing self-efficacy. Um, we learned in our last presentation that self-efficacy is our belief to manage difficult things uh, and our capabilities. Uh, increase self-esteem and increase optimism, all three of those if we work on uh, increasing those from a cognitive behavioral perspective, the way we think and behave, it can native, it can positively improve our depression. Um, cognitive behavioral therapy is uh, effective with anxiety and depression. And we come back to our appraisals, how we're making sense of things. Um, do we, are we um, engaging what's called depressogenic thinking, which is like, say you have one, uh, you have a symptom that's re re resulted in a disability. Do you keep your grief to that disability or do you take that grief to mean that life isn't worth living? if you don't have that ability or that possibility. That's what's called depressogenic thinking in the mental health field. So 
we're taking real, real negative things that we have to learn to cope with, but we're making them bigger than they are um, in the way that we're thinking about that. Often we do that when there is a lack of self-efficacy, that we don't believe that we could adapt enough to make a more meaningful, purposeful life. So doubling down from our anxiety pr uh, presentation, we really want to uh, deal with these threat appraisals about how harmful things are and how much we can deal with them, um, as well as adjusting uh, our, our life goals or the way we meet our life goals. Often um, with chronically, chronic illness or disability, we could still preserve what was behind our goal. Maybe you can't climb Mount Everest, but if the goal was adventure or exploration, maybe you can find new ways to explore and be adventurous that you haven't thought of before. Uh, related to uh, depression is working on our unfavorable social comparisons. You know, stop comparing yourself to healthy people. Like the sooner you can stop that, the better off you'll be. Compare, if you have to compare, compare yourself to uh, maybe your ill self or ill others who have similar challenges as you. Um, if you do the other, you it will take you astray. It'll take you down a dark path. This was an, an interesting study related to um, coping with depression as it relates to CBT and self-efficacy, self-esteem, and optimism. Now, this was on caregivers who were caring for someone who had dementia. Um, now, it showed that well-being was positively correlated with self Efficacy, self-esteem, and optimism. Well-being was is basically defined how we feel inside of ourselves. An interesting aspect of this study is that those three things weren't necessarily associated with improved quality of life. So what that says is that these caregivers of people with dementia, their quality of their life had a lot of limitations because of their responsibilities. But given that, they were still able to access a sense of well-being by in increasing self-efficacy, self-esteem, and optimism. And in short, it makes it bear, if not bearable, uh, positive. It, there could be some positivity access with the reduction in quality of life. Uh, I found that to be a very hopeful study. Related to, um, if you're going to go the therapy or counseling route, there is a, a subtype of therapy called interpersonal therapy that was developed um, in a medical setting. And it's based on depression and chronic illness. And it, it's solely based essentially on improving the quality of your relationships to improve, improve your, um, your depression. And it's shown to be an effective treatment if you're wanting to learn more about that. That's a term you can look up. In addition to that, there are behavioral adjustments that we can make. Again, uh, this, we're going to double down here from our anxiety presentation. Approach orienting coping becomes paramount. Um, approach orienting coping is accepting the reality of the situation and actively working to adjust to it. This includes information seeking, problem solving, seeking social support, creating and maintaining outlets for emotional expression. You got to share your feelings one way or another to, for that catharsis and connection to let it all out. And then uh, eventually identifying benefits in one experience. Mindfulness practice has shown to have um, a positive impact, particularly related to those with cancer. And then um, limiting or eliminating toxic relationships or um, dynamics. So because of the stress of chronic illness, you may have to put up more barriers uh, or boundaries with certain people in your life. And it may even go to the extreme to actually ending certain relationships that you just probably won't be able to manage anymore due to your illness, depending on how toxic the dynamics are. Now, what suggests toxicity is do these people criticize you? Do you feel safe to express what you're feeling? Are they a consistent presence in your life? Um, while positive uh, indicators that these are healthy relationships are people that are judgment free, they uh, promote and accept open and honest and direct communication expression. You can trust that they're going to have continued contact and support in your life. These all are very positive, and so we want to increase the presence of those kinds of relationships and people or strengthen double down on, if we already have relationships that include those kind of characteristics, we want to double down on those relationships to the degree that we can. So general 
uh, in terms of general uh, coping strategies independent of chronic illness, these have been shown to be effective for depression and something to think of. Um, natural adjustments can include exposure to sunlight. Seasonal affective disorder is a form of depression and we find that people who are limited to light, the, the sunlight decreases uh, with the seasons in most places. Um, if you're chronically ill, you're probably housebound and bedbound more often. You're not getting enough sunlight. That can help. Uh, rigorous exercise if you're physically capable and you don't have functional capacity limitations which prohibit it. Um, that is one of the most low cost, robust findings um, is the natural uh, effects, positive effects of exercise on depression. There are also some evidence of natural supplements, like for example, fish oil has shown to have an effect on depression and improve sleep hygiene and sleep schedule, making sure that you're going to bed at the same time, um, going, uh, getting up at the same time, um, maintaining restful sleep, not disturbing it with you know getting on your phone or whatever. Those are all natural adjustments that we can make to decrease the effect of our depression. Whereas medical interventions, this is beyond the scope of my license, but uh, I'll list them here in case you're interested. So we have psychopharmaceuticals, which are antidepressants such as SSRIs. These are like Paxil, Prozac, Luvox, things of that nature, as well as ketamine treatment has become a new um, up and coming treatment. Um, alpha stim is one. Uh, people who do alpha stim, they'll put these electrodes on your ears and it's shown to benefit anxiety and depression. There's also what's known as transcranial magnetic stimulation, um, stimulating your brain. And in more severe cases, um, electroconvulsive therapy. Um, typically, uh, you wouldn't go that route until it's been very severe and perhaps maybe even you had depression, which pre-existed your chronic illness situation. But those are all things you could discuss with a medical provider who treats depression. So that's a brief overview. If you're depressed, you're not alone. Again, it's very common related to um, depression. There is hope. These treatments listed are effective. Um, often there's not a magic silver bullet. It can be a combination of these different treatments, trying them out and seeing what works best for you. If you're interested in any more of this uh, information, here's a list of reference as like, you can dive deeper into any of them. Um, as well, we're happy to hear, have you continue. Um, as we finish our third installment, we'd love to have you for the rest of our installments related to the psychology of chronic illness, making it normal. You can find them through the Bateman Horn Center website, and we thank you for your time and attention.